there's two links in the in the email. Perfect. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, hopefully she uh, can catch up with us. Um, Becky, um, if you can uh, please explain how the public can participate in this evening's agenda. And Good evening, everyone. Viewers are welcome to provide public comment online through Zoom or by telephone at 669-900-9128. And the meeting ID is 857-8558. 0921 pound. If you're watching this meeting through Zoom, please select the participants button and select raise hand if you wish to speak. If you're participating by telephone and wish to speak, press star nine. When it's your turn to speak, you will be notified by the host and you will uh, for you to participate. And you need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you are unmuted, you will have two minutes to provide your comments. Great, thanks so much, Becky. Um, are there any amendments to this evening's agenda before we move on? There are none. Wonderful, then we can call our first agenda item, which is the approval of the regular meeting minutes of September 17th, 2020. Um, are there any questions? I had a comment. Sure. I believe it shows that the chair left early, and I believe it was I that had to move on uh, to another meeting. That is correct. Okay, so let the record reflect that change. Thank you. Any others? Like to open the public comment? I don't believe we have uh, anyone from the public here, so... Uh, there won't be any comment from them. And we can close that portion of it. And um, how about a motion to accept the minutes? I'll so make moved. a motion to accept the minutes. In second. A second. In a second, thank you. And Becky, if you would call roll, please. Yes, uh, Commissioner Emerson. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Gutierrez? Yes. Commissioner Lauman? Yes. Commissioner Machado? Aye. Commissioner Obletz? Yes. Commissioner Reisinger? I abstain. I was trying to zoom in. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Chair Jones? Yes. Great, thank you very much, that passes. We move on to our agenda item number two. Um, introduction, awards, recognitions, presentations. And um, I believe we have a presentation for the Recreation Division COVID-19 response and service modification. We sure do. So thank you, Chair Jones and Park and Rec Commission. I'd like to introduce, I'm gonna allow everyone to kind of wave, um, but I'd like to introduce all of our managers. You are very familiar with Catherine Kufa, uh, Kelly Elbrick, Steve Mason, Rochelle Gretchman Didley, and Debbie Youngkin. They're all on tonight. I will be covering um, a little bit about um, how we started with COVID and the early, early stages. They're here to answer any questions about kind of the early part of it. And when I'm speaking to that, I'm really talking about from March to about May, when we were mainly shut down with some exceptions. Um, from that point on, we will cover summer and currently our fall. And each one of the managers will cover their areas. And they are also here tonight to answer any questions, if you have any, or clarifications. So I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody hear me OK? We're using new technology tonight. so. Let's see, I'm gonna share my screen if it'll let me. Doing the same thing I did earlier, let's see. Okay. I'm gonna to have to go back out and come back in. It's, it's not allowing me to share again. Okay, 
I will be right back. Sure. And while she's doing that, I want to welcome everyone. It's, uh, we don't get a lot of visitors, so uh, it's always nice to see happy faces. Separately, I know it's not necessarily part of this purview, but I want to say I've enjoyed using a little bit more of the recreation facilities now that we've moved into a different COVID tier as a family member. It's been really nice. I am personally trying to really plug a Lego class for my kid to get into at Center Fall Community Center, um, which is the indoor program. Crossing my fingers, I've been talking a lot to, um, I believe he's a coordinator, Jason very nice individual helping me with the Lego class, trying to be like, please <laughs> sign up. Um, but it's been really nice to have um, more options available. So thank you everyone for making those um, happen. That's great. There we go. Now I feel, there we go, yay. <laughs> Great oh job. my goodness. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers because it's been kind of dicey for some reason. Alrighty. So we're here to talk about library and recreation COVID-19 response and the service modifications. And the reason why I'm including the library in the beginning is in the very beginning, we were very much integrated into our response in regarding supporting the EOC and disaster service work. So I thought it was important to not exclude them at this point. So in the very beginning, um, on March 16th, as you all know, all city services, including the libraries, were shut down in response to the county public health shelter in place order. Parks and recreation facilities were immediately closed. Programs, events, rentals were canceled and or rescheduled. And why that's important is immediately, along with our peer organizations out there, we all canceled our programs, but in many cases, we weren't sure how long it was going to last. At first we were told, you know, three to four weeks. If you all remember that, it was till April and then it was to the end of May. So staff was very busy canceling rentals and programs and rescheduling them for summer with the anticipation that we actually could re reopen in summer. So uh, they kind of did the start and stop several times. Um, then department staff quickly transitioned all the regular hire staff to remote working environment. So a lot of the staff at that point, because of our facilities were shut down, were busy with refunds or rescheduling. But for the majority of the time, they switched into supporting the emergency operations center and or served as disaster service workers. With our temp staff, I think we've been very clear since the beginning, um, all the temp staff were not scheduled beginning in March unless they were supporting what was called or considered an essential service like supporting childcare. And then later um, that also included lifeguarding and aquatics programs. Staff used existing technology and a creative approach to create new online services as well as promoting existing online and remote programs and services. In case you were wondering, not everybody had a computer at their disposal with a camera and or microphone. So within days, we were handing out Chromebooks and surfaces and jerry-rigging everything that we could and doing a remote desktop. Um, and it was a very much a kind of a learn in progress in the very beginning, but uh, probably about four weeks in, we became pretty masterful at how we utilize um, our electronic services. So when we started to go into the, uh, Emergency Operations Center, the department in total um, supported three sections of the Operations Center. The Operations Center is divided into different sections that focus on planning, logistics, ops, uh, public information, emergency services. So normally, Park and Rec will fall under operations and specifically they'll fall under something called care and shelter. Um, because this department was essentially closed down, it really um, made us accessible and available to the rest of the organization to support it in many other sections that we normally wouldn't do. So the three sections that we supported in total as a library and rec department, which was child care, we supported people who are experiencing homelessness, food distribution, COVID-19 testing, uh, canal outreach with the public information office section, 
we, su uh, we supported press releases, we provided citywide communications and pushed on social media. And then logistics, um, we not only had staff running around, closing off, taping off playgrounds, tennis courts, you name it, they also were responsible for coordinating everybody else's work assignments and making sure all that documentation was um, uploaded on the city's web, on our server, excuse me, and also coordinating supplies. A couple of the examples there you see are just highlights. One was called the Great Plates Program. The other one is a picture of the downtown street team mobile shower unit that lived here on Thursdays at the San Rafael Community Center. And by the way, all of your managers had key roles in providing those services during that time. Many of them served as section chiefs or assistant or were areas like um, care and shelter with child care, Kelly, obviously took the whole role on. A little bit more um, information in regards to the operation center and the types of disaster service work. Now keep in mind this is just kind of a, a, a sampling and so staff will be letting you know a little bit more about what they offered as well. But in the beginning we offered pop-up child care for essential workers and that that was out of Vallecito. Um, as I mentioned, portable showers um, and blood drives were hosted here at the San Rafael Community Center. Um, the library, in conjunction with digital services, distributed 150 hotspots, Wi-Fi hotspots, to San Rafael um, City School students, primarily in the canal area. Um, there was meal distribution and testing at the El Boro Community Center. A, huge citywide mass donations, the collection, the washing, and donating of masks to the community was also coordinated through this department. Um, again, we provided translation services. We had a project called Calling Older Adults Project where we reached out to adults over the age of 90 and then over the age of 70 and over seven and then over the age of 70 and called them once a week to see how they were doing and to let them know what resources were available to them. Um, staff also worked on the census project and another sampling is they distributed free books at two of the elementary schools during the time that either mills were being um, picked up or there were testing opportunities. So as we started to do a little bit more than just the emergency service work, um, both library and recreation started to offer and kind of transitioning most of their programs and services that they could to a virtual platform. So during this time, the recreation team launched something called San Rafael Active and Well Social Media Campaign and their virtual recreation center. And what that, what the social media campaign did and what that site did was push out things like our virtual programs and events, like the 14 day fitness and wellness challenge that Hobbit kind of spearheaded. Um, we had the National Water Safety Month that Tiffany really took the helm of and, and pushed that out. Um, I'm sure if you didn't participate, you might have heard of monthly, sometimes more than once a month, the Wacky Wednesday virtual bingo nights with a variety of themes um, that Patty McCauley did. And then of course, in the social media campaign, we also highlighted activities that families can do and neighborhoods could do for Earth Day, Easter, 4th of July, and things like the campaign on kindness rocks where you could paint rocks and put them throughout the community. In addition, staff transitioned a lot of their programs to a virtual platform and things like Taekwondo, ceramics, yoga, Spanish, dance, theater, watercolor, even the junior giants were all coordinated virtually. We also joined with our partners um, in Marin, the other park and recreation agencies to on a campaign called Marin Plays at Home. And one of the things that we did together was called Earth Day Activities. On the right of your screen, uh, just a little sampling of some of the screenshots for the social media campaign. And on the very top, very proud to say that the city of San Rafael got what was called a, a virtual five snaps. What that means is there are five board members on the CPR CPRS board for the state of California, and they were recognizing agencies for being extremely innovative and thinking outside of the box early on. And our agency was the third one to receive this um, virtual award, and they received it by being the first agency in California to offer pop-up child care for essential workers. So it was pretty exciting. 
the library also offered virtual programs and services, so I, I won't spend too much time on that, but I wanted to make sure you were aware they were offering Facebook Live and Pint Size Story Times, which were extremely um, successful. They were both in English and Spanish. And what was fun was the librarians had their children participate. So it, in many cases, it was a mom and mini me um, providing the Facebook Live and the Pint Size Story Times, which were really well received. They also did a virtual chat. Normally, people call the library or come into the library for references and materials and what to do. They did that virtually seven days a week. Um, they also offer programs for school age kids. They have a program um, called Zip Books, which is really exciting. Um, it is provided and funded through the state of California. And what that is, is people could go in, fill out a form, order a book, and that book would be mailed to their home via Amazon for free. And they could keep it or they could turn it back into the library and then it would come be part of the circulation. So that was hugely popular, especially when the library was closed. They also, as we mentioned before, did a children's book distribution. They did a virtual library card project with schools. So the children could use their school IDs in the, in the interim if they didn't have a library card so they could check out materials and they coordinated that with the San Rafael City School District as well as Miller Creek. Um, they also helped the school district in the very beginning, and they're still doing it now, where they embedded librarians into each of the elementary school sites to help support the teachers teach remotely so they could provide reference materials to the children and the families that were trying to do a remote learning uh, environment home. So that's just a little bit about the other side of the house. So this is where we're going to, I'm gonna let our marvelous staff talk a little bit. Um, we're gonna first talk about the summer, which means from about June through August. And we're gonna go in the order of how it's listed here so everybody has an opportunity. Please, if there's any questions or clarity or staff, if you wanna refer back to anything that you did during the, the early COVID times, please feel free to do so. So um, starting now, we'll have Kelly um, speak about Child care. Hi everyone, great to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about child care. Um, obviously, you're all aware of the pop up child care that we ran starting on March 19th. And then from there, we transitioned into, you know, how do we get our families back into our programming? And as the essential list grew, we were able to slowly open up our programs. Um, so, our first program to open up alongside our pop-up was our Pickleweed Preschool. We were able to open up that on April 20th um, to our essential worker families. And um, at that time, we opened up to a 10-person pod at Pickleweed. Um, there were only, out of the 48 families, there were 10 families that qualified as essential and needed services in our three-hour preschool program. And then our other 38 children were um, offered virtual learning that my uh, preschool teachers did up until June 12th. Um, in addition to that, we opened up Parkside Preschool to a small group of essential uh, families in early May. It was probably a handful of families. And then opened up our school age center towards the, uh, I think it was around third week of May to our school age families. And we actually surveyed all of the Miller Creek School District in addition to San Rafael City Schools. And we were able, there were about 14, no, 12 families that um, were interested in having care from late May to the end of the um, June 12th round. And um, it was about a three week session. So that was exciting to kind of bring the staff back in. Um, after running pop-up, there were some doing um, the calls to the seniors and then also working at home. So it was great to slowly bring my staff back in to uh, run these programs. And then summer um, started on June 15th and um, that's when everyone came back. So um, for my school age sites, we opened up um, all three in the Miller Creek School District, which is Mary Silvera, Lucas Valley and Vallecito. And then um, in San Rafael City Schools, Parkside, Coleman and Glenwood all opened up. Um, four of the six centers opened up to two cohorts of 12 each. Um, and my Mary Silvera and Glenwood site opened up to one cohort of 12 children. Um, and that was from June 15th to August 14th. And they were three week sessions. And 
it's pretty much the same families in each session and um, periodically we would get a new family in, um, but it was it was mostly um, our existing families that go to our program year round that used our program this summer. And in addition to that, Parkside Preschool reopened on um, to all the families on June 15th. And we were um, able to serve 36 uh, children that came back on June 15th. And um, they had three pods of 12. Um, and we ran our program up until August 14th and then prepared for the fall programming. Um, in addition to that, Jason Fong, my, our youth services coordinator, he ran some in-person camps at the community center. Um, that included um, a theater camp, a play well engineering camp, and a build your dream dollhouse camp, which I heard was a huge hit. Um, in addition to that, he ran some virtual camps as well. Um, so it was a busy center for staff and <clears throat> it was great getting everyone back at work. And um, it was, you know, challenging at times navigating the public health guidelines in addition to, hi. Oh yeah, sure, sorry, janitor. Um, in addition to, uh, the community care licensing regulations and I mean as you know those were changing weekly and um, kind of staying um, making sure we were on top of everything and on all the COVID protocols and um, but everything it the programming was amazing my staff did an amazing job parents were thrilled and they felt really safe to drop off their child every day so it was success and that's it for child care any questions? Thank you, Kelly. Welcome. All right, so I'm next. Thank you uh, for having us. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. As most of you know, I'm Steve from the Albert J. Borough Community Center. And pre-COVID, we were involved with the census push that the county had in the canal to make sure everybody was counted. And hosted yeah, I this. recruiting and training. I, I just, uh, I just Oh, you don't have any? I don't know. No, I'm not even hearing them. Oh. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. No. No. Oh, I, can, we, I think we can hear you. There might be something going on with Susan's. Okay. Um, so we were involved with, with promoting the census so that people in the canal were all counted. Um, and then unfortunately we had to cancel. We had lots more trainings on the books and, and we were partnering with Canal Alliance to have a big census celebration, kind of with music and food to get everybody in there. So that was canceled, but we did try to, to continue meeting virtually and the center promoted via Facebook and our electronic side, encouraging sign, encouraging people to, to uh, be counted. And that went through today. Um, as Susan said, we closed down in mid-March. Um, our part-time staff, which included our front desk staff, gym attendants, and our facility attendants were no longer scheduled. Um, we reached out to all of our renters and programs and participants, informing them of the closure, which we thought was only a couple of weeks. And then we've continued every, every month to give them updates of, as far as where we are. Um, as Susan also said, we were involved with the EOC. I served a rotating role with Catherine and Debbie as operations section chief and also as uh, lead support and operation. Our program coordinator at the center, Hobbit, he, uh, he's been working um, through the EOC with the county as far as the food distributions, uh, touching base with them to see what kind of needs they had, whether it's traffic control, equipment, like A-frames and cones, uh, signs, uh, coordinating volunteers, and just try to have a cohesive group throughout the county of, of food distribution. And he's still continuing to distribute um, the sites with current testing flyers um, to pass out to the people. Uh, we have hosted a food distribution every Tuesday at the borough in the parking lot. Um, and that'll continue through November and that's with the SF Marin Food Bank. Um, also in our parking lot, we did some COVID testing very early in the pandemic. And then at the end of the school year, multiple schools set up spots where students could come by and pick up their belongings that were left in the classroom and as far as um, some assignments. And then again, we repeated that in the beginning of the school year with the, with the school district. Um, public Wi-Fi early in the pandemic, our digital services was able to pump up the um, Wi-Fi signal from the Pickleweed Library. And people, kids could come if they didn't have Wi-Fi at home and, and sit outside the center or we designated a few parking stalls where the center where the signal was strong enough where they could sit in their parents car and do some homework that way 
since then, that pro project has expanded um, and the public Wi-Fi and it's, they've set up a tower on top of the center as well as um, in various apartments and street lights um, to get more of a Wi-Fi signal throughout the canal. So that's continuing to, to go on. Um, in addition to the part-time staff being let go, we took a blow this summer. Um, Hobbit ended up having a positive test in his household. So he was out from July 4th through August 6th. And our custodian, Juan Carlos Sordo, had a work-related injury. So he's been out since July 11th so, or 13th. So he's, it's been pretty thin for a while. Um, we continue to do COVID messaging all through the summer, um, reminding people to wear face masks and keep six feet apart using our social media and our electronic sign out front and um, various A-frames throughout the park. During the summer, we were able to have some in-person in programs. Uh, we had a volleyball. We had two three-week volleyball sessions um, with cohorts of 12 participants, and we served over 140 kids in the six-week time. Um, and being able to do that transitioned us from working remotely to being in the center, so we were also more accessible to the general public who were stopping by with questions and all. Our friends in the Pickleweed Library, as Susan mentioned, uh, were able to do curbside uh, pickup of books. Um, so it was nice having that activity going. Um, we had outdoor rentals. Several of our churches were able to rent their back deck um, in the summertime. And Pickleweed Park, obviously the playground was closed, picnic area and the soccer fields. Fortunately, the playground is open to the delight of many. Um, as you remember, we've got that new playground out there, so it's very difficult for people to stay off of it. Um, but that opened up last week. Our soccer fields have remained closed, even though some activities are allowed on open space like that. But as you know, the, the soccer fields have been primarily used for soccer, which is a, not considered a safe activity. Um, so staff, as well as the EOC, have decided it's best to keep that closed. So that's my update for right now, and we'll circle back in later with our call. And it goes to Rochelle. I'm hoping the soccer fields look great right now. <laughs> yes. Good evening, everyone, and uh, it's really nice to see you. I, I don't believe I've ever been to a meeting with some of you, so I'm Rochelle. Hi. I'm in charge of the San Rafael Community Center and Albert Park Field and a bunch of other things that I'll forget, I'm sure. Um, the initial thing that happened when COVID hit and we closed everything down was a lot of cancellations of big events, quinceaneras, weddings, and, and things like that. And um, that was devastating having to give people the news that we weren't going to be able to hold their function that they had been planning in some cases for a year. Um, really heartbreaking. Um, we're able to actually offer um, dates later, but now as we keep going into this rabbit hole of COVID, I, I just really don't even know when that will open up again. So I spent a lot of time doing that initially, canceling classes and events, refunding people. Um, but we also had time to do some projects that we didn't, wouldn't have time for regularly. We did a park amenity inventory. We updated some policies. We did some painting and cleaning, deep cleaning in the community center. Um, so we did get to do some things that we wouldn't have normally gotten to do, which was great. Um, some of the things that I'm the most proud of is we hosted the streets team showers on Mondays and Thursdays from March 19th to July 16th. It was really, really great to have folks there. The folks that work for streets teams are outstanding and really, um, it was a really helpful thing. Um, people really counted on it and we're still even getting people even now coming and saying, wait, where did the showers go? Um, they did a lot of events too that piggybacked on that. San Rafael PD was involved in one, the fire department was involved in one and they just brought together a bunch of other service providers to help folks out. It was a really, really great partnership and I'm really proud that we were able to help them um, the way we were, it was great. Um, we also partnered with American Red Cross and Vitalant, which are both um, blood collection agencies. We have had, in the summertime, we had six blood drives where we collected 295 units of blood, which sounds like, oh, that's a lot, you need them. But that covered 885 patients that we were able to help with blood that we collected at our blood drives. Um, that relationship has been really great. American Red Cross loves coming to our community center because it's really cold and apparently that's a thing when you're giving blood. Um, but just 
figuring out how many people that's going to impact. Um, you know, just proud to be involved with them at all. Um, they also were testing for antibodies for COVID, which was interesting. A lot of people were really interested to know if they had had it and didn't know, and did they have antibodies? So they were, they were providing that as part of what they were doing with the blood collection, which was great. Um, some of the things that, um, that kind of were unintended side things. Uh, the Pacifics obviously canceled their entire season, which was sad. It's the first time in many, many years that we haven't had them out on the field. Um, but because they weren't allowed to be on the field and um, camps were allowed to operate, I was able to um, offer the field to three different travel ball teams who had stable cohorts of players with their coaches um, in three week sessions. And so it was great to let some folks that wouldn't ever get a chance to be on that field, uh, be able to play in the field. And it was in such great condition and still is in really great condition this year, thanks to our parks uh, partners who have really just taken great care of it this year. Um, we were really lucky. We're so lucky, in fact, we're gonna be able to have folks on the field until the middle of November, which is excellent. So that was um, not only made us some money, some revenue, but also allowed us to let some folks on the field that have never been on that field before. And it's for baseball players, especially younger kids, it's a really, really big deal to get to play there. Um, they couldn't play games, but it didn't, they didn't care. They loved it. Um, we also had uh, one of Steve's volleyball programs at Boro decided that maybe not being inside was a great thing. So they played out on that field. They did grass court doubles, which um, we used to run some huge tournaments back in the late 90s um, and that were just amazing. And so having kids out there playing grass court volleyball was fun too. The tennis courts opened at some point. Um, we uh, hadn't sold tennis keys in a couple of years. We started selling them again and um, went out to the courts and actually met people where they were. And the tennis courts are being used a lot right now and a really good recreation outlet for folks who are been in the house for a really long time. Uh, so that's been really good. Um, and then um, I have a program coordinator that works in my building, Patty McCulley. She's uh, involved with a lot of the virtual classes we did and the Wacky Wednesday Bingo, which is a lot of fun. But her main job was trying to keep the San Rafael Golden Airs connected. When the shutdown happened, they were in that group of folks that were the most vulnerable. And so a lot of them were homebound and by themselves. And Patty organized book and puzzle swaps, virtual painting classes, watercolor, tea time, show and tell. Um, she went, they did a garden chat. She went out and took pictures of people in their homes and put them in their newslet, newsette that she does, really trying to keep them connected and um, engaged while we were all on the shutdown. So. Those are the main things that happened up until the summer. So I believe that Debbie is next, unless anyone has questions. Thanks, Rochelle. Hey, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, it has been quite the wild ride. Uh, I do feel like, you know, the last so many months does feel like multiple years um, in some ways. And let's see, uh, just starting back in March, um, you know, I, I helped with the EOC as much as possible, playing different roles. But during that process, I was also doing a lot of research and sitting on national calls for aquatics, uh, state calls for aquatics, and trying to figure out if there was going to be any way for us to open up the Terra Linda or the Hamilton pool for the season. Um, luckily, my involvement with that, I was also tapped into Marin Recovers um, and asked to help facilitate aquatics discussions with pool operators in Marin County to kind of set some standards for Marin to follow for aquatics to be considered to reopen. Um, after a lot of conversations, we did put together a proposal for the county and the county finally did approve for outdoor pools to reopen. Um, approval was in June, and uh, luckily with support of Catherine and Susan and Jim, uh, we were able to develop a model that would be cost covering for the Terra Linda pool to open. Um, unfortunately, we did have to back out of our agreement with Hamilton. It just wasn't realistic for us to open both pools for this season based on staffing and cost recovery and everything that we needed. Uh, two pools was not realistic, but we were fortunate that we could operate the Hamilton or the Terra Linda pool. Uh, we did open with a lap swim model. So it's one swimmer per lane for all eight lanes. 
And we offer 45 minute swim blocks uh, with a 15 minute turnover for disinfection. And we also offer one water walking lane. So everyone is socially distant, able to come in for a swim, book your reservation in advance. Um, we did implement a no refund policy just to make sure that people weren't going in there and gobbling up all the reservations um and then not allowing opportunities for others to get in so that has been kind of an incentive so when people go to reserve their spot uh they actually try to keep that time um and let's see and we also based on there was a model that it's uh based on square footage is the amount of people that you could allow into your pool uh so when we didn't do the lab swim model we provided a rec swim model and we were allowed to have 22 swimmers in for Rec Swim, our staff did a really good job of trying to monitor families to make sure that they weren't uh, coming inside each other's areas and were able to remain socially distant, which was a really great opportunity for families to come into the pool for a 90 minute swim. And then we had a half, over, half hour disinfection time between groups. Um, everything has been booked up pretty solid and uh, it's been very well received from the community. Um, we also were approached by the Orca swim team. They were very interested in getting their kids back in the water. So we were able to work with the swim team and allow them the opportunity to come back in under the same conditions as a lap swim. So they could have eight kids in the water at a time and would turn over to the pool to the next group. And what they did was they followed the childcare guidelines in which they had uh, children sign up for a three week minimum time, a specific time frame. So they were always staying with their specific cohorts. And it's been really successful. We would receive nothing but positive feedback um, from the parents who are involved in the swim team program. And other than that, um, we all, a lot of our programs went virtual. So we got that set up and our beloved ceramics program, uh, our teacher Nadia did a virtual ceramics program and at the time when businesses could start reopening for curbside she actually approached and said hey could i open for curbside firing so her students who had been working on their projects uh, virtually were able to sign up for a time to come by and drop off their piece to be fired and then come back and pick it up so that was great to see because the community center was getting used again and uh, people were feeling that connection by the time the summer hit we were able to implement some of our programs like our splash camp, our junior guards, our babysitter, and uh, fun with clay with Nadia. So we had a very busy summer. There was always activity going on here. It was great to see people coming by. Um, I have to say that I was fortunate that I was able to work out of the community center. So when random people came by with questions, um, I was here to be able to provide support to them curbside, um, but I was still here able to provide support. And, uh, you know, I'm really appreciative that I have a great coordinator because she was instrumental in getting the pool up and running. Uh, we had to figure out how to train staff, how to set the facility so safety standards were in place for uh, the pool to be open. And um, all in all, everything has been running pretty smoothly and successfully during this time. And that's it for summer. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna take on the Falkirk Cultural Center. Um, I think everyone's aware that Ashley used to run the Falkirk Cent Cultural Center and she left to become the, um, park, uh, the park and rec director at Corn Madeira, but we were very lucky that we were, had some very talented bench on our team and we were able to steal um, Darcy Cello from the Terralinda Community Center, and she's been working at the Falkirk Cultural Center, um, kind of taking care of the programming at that facility. So, like um, like the rest of the, the like the rest of the, our facilities, um, come in March there was a big push to cancel a lot of the re the rental reservations. So at Falkirk Cultural Center, we obviously have a lot of big wedding life event rentals. So. Um, you know, that was really difficult to have to cancel these, these weddings and these life events. Um, although I think, you know, people were very understanding and really appreciative that we were being, you know, putting health and safety first. Um, 
the, the big events that normally take place at Falkirk are these our wedding rentals and then our, our art galleries. So both of which obviously cannot continue as normal um, with the COVID restrictions. So once we kind of got through the initial wave of, of cancellations and started to be able to open things back up a little bit, um, we started to think creatively about what, how we could re, rethink the types of programming that happens at Falkirk. So actually very quickly, we had been set to open up our spring juried show. Um, I think we just had a handful of people come in through the facility to look at the, the spring jury show when we had to close down the building. Um, and quickly, um, staff put a new plan in place to host a Facebook Live sh to show each piece um, and announce the winners of the show via Facebook Live. So I think that was, it, it worked pretty well. Folks were very receptive. Um, it was posted on a variety of marketing avenues. Um, and then ever since then, we've kind of done a similar approach for all of the art ex exhibitions that we had lined up. We've been doing them in a virtual format. So the next is, exhibit was the California Watercolor Association's Summer So Serene Show. And that was also held virtually through the city's website and the organizations that participated their website as well. Um, and I'm gonna go, our, our current exhibit, which is technically in the fall, but um, since we're talking about it here, was the Terra Linda Ceramics Artist Exhibit. And that is currently live right now, if you'd like to check it out. I actually saw it just got promoted through um, the city manager's snapshot newsletter. Um, additionally, starting in June, um, we were, we started renting out the wedding lawn at Falkirk for recreation and fitness classes um, and for any um, cultural or religious ceremonies that were permitted under the, the guidelines in June. So we ended up um, having a yoga fitness instructor that was running three classes three times a week on the Falkirk wedding lawn. And then we also had another class, um, a mommy and me um, class that meets, I think, uh, twice a week on the lawn. Um, we also had two summer camps that took place at the Falkirk Cultural Center in June and July. Um, and we, this really pushed us to, to think creatively and um, Darcy worked with one of our kind of longtime supporters to create a new outdoor watercolor class that has been incredibly successful. I think it, it booked up within a day of going out online and being promoted. So she, that's been running since August. Um, we've got two classes a week um, and that's been, been very popular. Additionally, the Master Gardeners continue to do their work. It's outside, they're socially distant, so that's been great. Um, and we actually were able to work with them in July to do their annual succulent sale. Um, that's kind of one of their big fundraisers that they use to support their program. Um, and with outdoor, um, outdoor retail being allowed, we were able to make it work using those guidelines. Um, and then we did allow a handful of kind of cultural ceremonies. There were a few folks, um, a few memorials that were, that took place on the Falkirk wedding long, as well as a few folks who wanted to continue on with um, kind of a reduced wedding um, that followed kind of the strict social distancing protocols that were in place. Um, I think the other thing just, you know, Debbie and Steve have already mentioned a lot of the EOC support that we did. Um, one other big uh, project that started in July was really focusing on the canal, the outbreak in the canal and supporting that neighborhood specifically since we were seeing such high rates and it really was kind of the epicenter of the pandemic in the county. So um, the city, a lot of our staff from, from library and recreation, um, we joined uh, the canal outbreak response team, which was formed by the county and it was county City, Marin Community Clinics, Kaiser, Canal Alliance, and Marin Health all coming together to um, try and increase uh, preventative behaviors, increase testing, and lower the case rates in the canal. Um, so we did, there was a bunch of different activities from organizing health education trainings for volunteers and outreach workers. Um, we set up a free distribution box, at, one's at Boro, outside of Boro Community Center, and one's outside of um, Pickleweed Library, where community members, we basically repurposed old newspaper racks, and they've got packets with information and free face coverings that community members can stop by and grab. Um, we had a code enforcement officer 
who visited 184 businesses in the canal to give them one-on-one -on -one technical assistance um, on how to set up their site-specific protection plans and how to open safely. Um, we had developed a huge masking campaign um, where we had a volunteer photographer come and take really amazing portraits of canal residents wearing masks and um, those were designed into posters kind of explaining why folks choose to mask and what's the importance of masking and they were put up I don't, if anyone's been in the canal neighborhood late, lately they're on every street post um, they're all over the pickle park they're in many different businesses um, so that that was a really big effort that and our team played a big role in getting those up um, and then just doing kind of direct outreach at food distributions, um, at the testing sites, launching a social and traditional media campaigns. Um, so that's been, that's been a big, a big effort. That was a big effort over the summer and, and it continues even now. So I think we might be done with, with summer. I don't know, Susan, do you want us to just head right into, go back and head into our fall programming? Yes, that would be great. All right, Kelly, fall programming. Okay, uh, fall programming. So we started fall programming um, August 24th when school started. And so our programming, you know, switch modes a little bit for our school age programming because all the kids are um, doing school at home. So we're offering uh, virtual learning pods at the various school age sites. And um, our hours of operation are from 8 to 530. So we're doing, you know, online school from about 8 to 230, 8 to 3 um, at the respective, you know, different sites. And um, they arrive right at eight because they all have Zoom um, greetings in the morning at 8.30. So we're busy getting them um, all online. And at some of the sites, we actually have um, a big group of incoming kindergartners there. So um, that's been a challenge in itself, you know, trying to get them on their first Zoom. And then this little guy, um, I was subbing out at Glenwood that first week and he kept saying, when am I gonna meet my teacher? when am I going to see her in person? And it would just, it just broke my heart. Um, you know, we explained to him what's happening and he finally got it. But, um, but overall the pods are working out um, well. Miller Creek has already um, transitioned into school. So we have um, three classes at the respective schools that started on October, early October. And then uh, three more classes are gonna be transitioning in next week. So we have um, more people on campus where we have our childcare centers, which has been great. Um, it's a little challenging navigating, you know, the walking paths and bathrooms and um, making sure that we're not using, you know, the same space um, outside um, and that we're not outside while the teachers are teaching. So that's been a little bit challenging. And the San Rafael City Schools, they're still doing virtual learning and their uh, their plan to open, you know, they're not sure yet. They haven't set a date, but they do have a plan similar to Miller Creek where they'll be offering AM, PM model, three hours worth of school, and then the kids will come to us. Um, after or before um, their learning pod, I mean, before their classroom. Um, and then Parkside Preschool is open um, to, we reduced our enrollment um, and we're offering, let's see, we have two pods of 13 um, at Parkside Preschool. So we did not take any incoming three-year-olds for our programs. So we're just serving um, pre-K children and it's working out great. Um, and then our Pickaway Preschool opened in September to um, 58 children, and we are running an AM PM class as well out at Pickaway. So we're busy and um, everything's going really well. Um, and then in addition to that, Jason um, Fong, our wonderful youth service coordinator, is trying to offer um, some classes at the community center. So he has some signups um, at the community center where he's running um, a theater workshop and a kid dance um, brigade. And then as schools start to open, we'll kind of look into hopefully offering some more enrichment courses um, on school campuses. And um, that's just going to depend on, you know, if there are any empty rooms available and the comfort level of the school of 
possibly sharing space and you know the cleaning protocols and all that so um so that's that's it for fall programming Susan, is it appropriate for us to ask questions after each um, speaker? Absolutely, if you'd like to. Okay, so I'll, I'll put it out to everyone um, if anybody has any questions for Kelly about her previous and um, current um, presentation. And I was wondering, I guess nobody else had a question, I was wondering about the reduced enrollment, how that's affecting the bottom line. Um, yes, it's affecting the bottom line. Um, obviously, for example, at Parkside Preschool, we usually serve 48 children and we're serving 24. So our enrollment is at 50%. So what we did is we did increase our monthly tuition at the Parkside Preschool. Um, during this COVID time, it, it went up about $300 a month. In addition to in the school age cohorts, um, obviously we only offer full-time care and um, we increased, I mean, we're still only, I don't know, Catherine, our pro will know, but probably maybe 85% cost recovery, but maybe not even that. Um, but it's expensive. It's, you know, we're running, it's $389 a week. Um, and we usually run four week sessions and that's pretty much the going rate in the county as well. Um, and that's still not cost recovery. So it is a hurt, it, it's hurting our budget and um, yeah, we're hoping we'll make up for it in the spring, hopefully. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Steve, do you wanna go ahead? Sure. I think one of the more exciting things we've been doing in the uh, in last month or so is we have worked with the Marin County Office of Education and are now hosting learning hubs at both the Albert J. Borough Community Center and San Rafael Community Center. And at Borough, we're using every single room except the gymnasium for elementary school, middle school, and high school learning hubs. Uh, the elementary school cohorts are supervised by YMCA staff, and the middle school and high school are by MCOE and Canal Alliance staff. And the, or the uh, MCOE is um, paying for custodial, so we we're able to bring back some of our facility attendants that we had let go to come in and clean the facilities in the nighttime. Uh, digital services also stepped up, and the library had a much stronger Wi Fi than we did, so they were able to pump that up so that we could have 60 kids streaming their, um, their um, classes online all at the same time. So that's been fun having all those activities, you know, it's, we're not completely open to the public, but it's nice having people coming and going in the center now. Our church rentals have decided to stay outside on the back deck like they were in the summer, but one of them will be moving inside starting November 1st. We were able to bring back our canal karate program starting September 2nd with classes being held outside on the deck and then starting this week, their second session, they've uh, inside following the cohort um, sizes. Um, Volleyball, as, as Rochelle said, we started with volleyball in the summer, then they moved outside. Starting this week, they've rented our gym seven days a week for cohorts of no more than 14 players um, at a time. And they just play two on two volleyball so they can maintain the six foot uh, social distancing. Um, in, our, in the Canal Community Garden, we had an Eagle Scout project a few weeks ago. Jordan Lockie is one of the first female scouts in uh, Marin with Troop 1015. And she led a small group of uh, volunteers that beautified the, the park, uh, pulled a lot of weeds, and they built some special planter boxes now for some fruit trees um, for everybody's benefit in the community garden. We're continuing with virtual programs, but they're not going as strong as they were at summertime. I think there's a lot of computer fatigue with the kids being online um, all day for their classes, uh, but we still continue to offer them in case anybody wants to do it. Uh, I know a project that the commission has been very interested in in the past has been um, the soccer fields out at the uh, Pickleweed Park. And Catherine's taken the lead um, for the city as far as pursuing the Prop 68 statewide grant. Um, one great thing about this, um, and the, the grant, our intent was to, to convert the grass field to synthetic turf so that we could leave it open year round. In the past, we've been closing at six months of the year because it's so heavily impacted that it 
and it needs to be repaired. And if we have synthetic turf, we can leave it for the community because soccer is uh, a huge sport in the canal neighborhood. But one benefit from this is that the grant encourages us to add additional features to the park. And we had to do five community um, input sessions, which is very difficult during COVID si uh, times, but our team got together and they were pretty creative, I think. Um, we partnered with a couple of food distributions to uh, interview people while they were in line. Um, we partnered with Canal Alliance to kind of uh, do an online um, meeting with some of the community leaders and also with the Multicultural Center of Marin. Um, our Junior Giant program that we did virtually this year, we had prizes to distribute to people at the end of summer. So we also did the survey to those participants. And those are kids that are usually playing on the field anyways and families. So um, we're excited. Some of the, the I'm going to read this, some of the um, input we've gotten that the communities expressed is they want to add a state shade structure, trees and a gazebo in the picnic area, provide additional parking on the east end of the lot and an outdoor basketball court that's designed to also be used for overflow parking. Um, let's see, uh, shade throughout the park, um, additional trees, native drought tolerant, low maintenance landscaping project, uh, another playground um, activity for youth under five, and adult fitness equipment to be located near the playground. And that was one thing several years ago um, we're doing Measure A outreach and all that uh, was a great interest of the community too. So that's still rating up there. Um, lighting for the soccer field and basketball court, um, improved park restroom amenities, add security cameras in the park and field, pathway lightings, higher fence around the soccer field. Um, there was a, a desire to have a mural um, somewhere in the site plan, um, additional water fountains, possibly looking into the cost of a kayak launch or an off-leash dog area. Uh, the survey also went out on social media and there's a web, the website uh, www.cityofsanrafael.org slash pickleweed um, has it on there where people can take it. Um, as you know, we've been attempting to get funds for over 10 years and oftentimes it's, it's difficult competing statewide, um, but I think we really feel that this is our best chance yet. It's a quite amount of money that is going to be released and we're, we've got our fingers crossed. Um, Elections coming up, as all of us have heard, uh, we have a drop box in front of the center and that opened up a week ago Tuesday and it, we get a steady stream of people voting. Uh, they've also extended the polling days. So instead of just one day, we'll be open for four days for kids to come in or kids, adults to come in and vote um, from October 31st through November 3rd. And this will allow better social distancing for those waiting to vote in person. Uh, the city has also signed an agreement um, and worked with PG&E and we're installing equipment that allows PG&E to attach a generator to the Borough Community Center uh, so we can become a charging station uh, during a, a PSPS. And this also provides power to the rest of our classrooms too. So if we had an activity going during PSPS, we, we would have power too, which is great. And the last thing I want to mention, um, as many of you who have been on the commission for a while know, my favorite event of the year. Um, is uh, Day of the Dead, and the 32nd annual Dia de los Motos event is coming up. Um, we started planning in March, and then the first week in April we had our meeting and we decided we'd come up with some contingency plans, and thank goodness we did, because um, that really paid off for us. So we've, instead of a one-day event like we traditionally have, it's going to be a month-long event, or it is a month-long event, that kicked off October 1st. Um, with the altars that we usually have at the gymnasium, I reached out to a lot of the businesses downtown and we've got 23 altars that are on display in windows um, that people can go and, and walk around and see. And we were supported by the downtown uh, business improvement district who unfortunately had to cancel their trick or treat event because of COVID, but they were happy to hop on board doing something positive and help us make some of those connections to get the storefront windows. Um, the other in-person thing we're going to do is the procession, and rather than marching next to people, we're doing a car procession this year, where cars will come already decorated. We're going to meet at the Health and Wellness Campus on Sunday, November 1st at 530, and then we'll drive through the canal, and we've got a loop set out, and then at the end, everybody is supposed to go home so that we don't, there's no gathering or getting out of the cars. Uh, virtually, we've got entertainment. Um, we've got some of the favorite dancers and, and musicians that have played. Um, every day has got something plugged in. We're doing a youth talent show with prizes. Many of the local restaurants are offering discounts that are available from the website. And we do a lot of Facebook Live uh, events. 
um, stories or pick a wee library ask them they've done a couple bilingual day of the dead type stories so it's a lot of fun we're uh, it's it's a change and i think it's going to open some new doors for next year where we might have more of a hybrid event hopefully once once we are able to do things in person so that's my report thanks steve is there any questions i know uh, i'm apologize commissioner reisinger i missed you and uh, please ask your if you'd like at this time. I have some, I have some comments for Steve. Um, Commissioner Blitz, is it okay if I continue? Tom, can you let um, Commissioner Reisinger start? I missed her from the last one and then we'll hop back. Absolutely, no problem. Uh, wonderful, let me just look at my notes real quick. Um, so I just thank you everyone for the absolutely wonderful detailed reports. It sounds like there's so much more going on than honestly what I thought was happening. I feel as if I'm a pretty good social media. I get the you know, pamphlet. I look, I text people, I see what's happening. It sounds like there's so much more going on than is um, that I'm that I'm aware of. So what I was wondering was, instead of getting such a heavy report once every couple of months, is there a way that we can, as commissioners, get more pieced reports so that we can help support the managers and their programs, either socially or, or you know, coffee chats or talking to people, reaching out? Because there are so many things that I heard that I would have loved to have reached out to friends to be like, hey, did you know Sandra Falls doing this? Hey, did you know this? So just as a slight plug, I would absolutely love to do that to support the group. Um, and additionally with that, Steve, as you were just saying, the Dia de los Muertos at um, Alboro is an amazing event. I would love to support that however I can on my social media. Is there any way that some sort of you know, email can go out to us as commissioners where it's like, hey, if you feel like it's appropriate, please support our event with this social link or, you know, follow us here and like this or just send it out. I do remember with my interview with the city council was part of like, how are you going to share the word? How are you going to socially spread it out? And I would more than willingly, in any case, help support the event, everything that you guys are doing, because it sounds like you guys are doing so much more than I even know that was happening. But if I don't know about it, I can't support it. So um, just kind of wondering, because it's just you guys are doing such a wonderful job. And like I've been to Lap Swim, I've been to the bingo, I've been to the parks, and like it's all fantastic and would love for more people to know about it. So Chair Jones, I'm done. Thank you very much. That was my just just wondering because I, I think I speak for the commission that we would love to support our group. Yeah. It's a great point. Susan, is that something that we could uh, look forward to as a, as a commission here? Sure. Okay. Great. Chair recognizes Tom Oblitz, Commissioner Oblitz. All right, thanks. Again, I, I don't want to duplicate what was said before. And uh, Catherine did a great job of, of summarizing. Uh, especially wanted to acknowledge Steve and what's going on there at, at Borough Center and the, and the library. Again, you have been busy and you wear a lot of hats. Summer and fall programs look spectacular. And uh, the Day of the Dead, I see a lot of publicity about it, a lot of activity. Artworks downtown is, is heavily involved. And uh, the Scout Project, I'd like to know more about that offline. And uh, thank you for your leadership over there. Sure. With respect yeah. to the uh, director's slides, is it possible for us to get hard copies or, or PDFs of the slides that, that preceded this uh, presentation? Absolutely. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Oblitz. Is anyone else? You have a question? Um, Steve, I, I, I have one quick question for you. The, um, the Wi-Fi, is that going to be continuing throughout this? I mean, beyond hopefully the, the COVID piece that we're in right now and moving forward? Uh, the Wi-Fi that's going out into the community? 
So yes, yes. Um, you know, I think their long-term goal is to get all of San Rafael, but definitely the strongest need was the canal. So yeah. that, that's great. You know, starting and, and um, they were able to secure some funding from various sources, the county and um, Community Foundation, a few other places. So it's a matter of, you know, getting that, but definitely it's, it's continuing to grow and I think eventually we'll see it all over San Rafael. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I guess I'm up. So I, I apologize for the Pirates of the Caribbean look of my whole background, but the Dibley family is very loud and they're inside and they're abs it would be awful if they were on this call. You guys would not be happy. Um, so San Rafael Community Center. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot that's been going on since we reopened. So I'm just going to give you just a quick glimpse at that. Um, we were uh, able to identify some additional park spaces to open up some classes in. So we did um, open up Victor Jones Park, the field that's in between Bocce and the community center and child care, um, and some f a field up in Terra Linda as a place to um, be able to hold other classes. So what I was ha what I had at my facilities were um, I had a couple volleyball groups who did some grass court doubles um, to keep their kids on their club teams in shape. And we also had a small pod of children from Coleman School doing physical education a couple days a week out on our side field. It was really nice to just have some other activity out there, something different. Um, the community, some community members were not happy about it because they felt like uh, that was um, taking over their local park so it was a little bit of a balancing act which we weren't we weren't sure that was going to happen but it did and it's calmed down now we've made some adjustments so that's been good we uh, welcomed our friends from the YMCA and Marin County Office of Ed into the building um, that partnership serves two cohorts of students in elementary school um, and while I'm not supervising them, I do see them in their activities a bit during the day. It's just nice having some activity in the building. Um, and I know that the families and the schools appreciate that they have a place that their kids can go to get assistance. Um, we did do some work to the Wi-Fi in our building so that because our Wi-Fi uh, also covers the child care center at Parkside, um, we did have to do an upgrade. Um, and boy, you can sure tell when everyone's on their Zoom calls because things get a little crazy, but it's definitely been a huge asset to the community to have that in our building as well. We were able to um, host a cooling center and a clean air center in at San Rafael Community Center. We do have um, stationed at our building a generator that can run the whole building. Um, and so when we had those few days of 100, five, six, seven degrees, we had cooling centers. And then the very next week, the fires happened and we had some clean air, we had a clean air center open for a day. So um, that generator, my understanding is that it's gonna stay with us through this, this kind of time of year because uh, we're assuming that at some point we'll have an event where we're gonna need our center as a charging center again, like we did last year. Um, I already mentioned that the Albert Park field's being used again until November 15th, which is excellent. The Pacifics uh, just today sent me their proposed schedule for next year. They'll be renting again as they did uh, this past year and they've switched leagues. They're gonna be playing in the Pecos League uh, there are two sections of the Pecos League. One is in the Pecos. It's uh, some a couple Texas teams, a New Mexico team, Oklahoma, and I believe Arkansas. I can't remember the fourth one. And then in California, we'll have a team here, a team in Monterey, and two teams um, down sort of in the Bakersfield area. Um, so I haven't looked. I was actually on vacation today, so um, I haven't looked at their proposal yet, but I'm sure that we'll be able to accommodate them and look forward to them coming back uh, next year if should we be able to allow that um, uh, but, 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 oh so um, like I said before we did have the showers um, in the parking lot for a few months and one of the corollary um, activities that happened uh, was we had some folks from health and human services who were doing some mental health outreach some physical health outreach 
bringing clothes. So um, they are continuing on Thursdays to be in our back parking lot closer to the stadium from 1130 to 130. That just started last week. Um, they're helping out a lot of people. And um, because we don't have any big programs in the building where there's a lot of vehicles, we were able to do that and happy to help. Um, so that's been going really well. Um, Bocce opened back up a couple months ago. Uh, in September and they had some singles tournaments they've been doing make reservations and play during the day um, I just was on a call with them just before this meeting their board meeting and they um, they were able to secure a loan earlier this year which they just found out is now a grant and they don't have to pay it back which is excellent really helped them out to keep things going a bit um, but they are going to go out and try to get, um, do a fundraising effort to try to raise money just in case this spring we're not able to open back up with leagues. They really want to make sure that they're covered. So um, that's been really fun and interesting. And I like those folks a lot. They're a lot, they have a lot of energy. It's great. Um, we will have the election too in our building starting on Halloween. Uh, we'll have them in the building the 31st, November 1st, which is a Saturday, Sunday. And then uh, Monday and then the typical Tuesday. Um, we don't have a ballot box in front of our building. Originally, I thought we were going to, but it turned out we're not. So we will still be the voting spot, though, for the Gersel Park neighborhood, like we are, like we always are. Um, we welcome Church of the Open Door came back for in-person church inside. They take reservations, they check everyone's temperature, and they've been with us for two weeks now and couldn't be happier to be back. We did reach out to um, AA. We had a large AA meeting in our building, and I feel like that's been a thing that's been difficult for folks and really trying to figure out a way to get them back. But it is the largest AA meeting in Marin with over 300 people. And right now, trying to keep that, that meeting under 100 uh, would be difficult. So we're trying to get them back in, but it's, right now it's not looking like that's going to happen anytime soon. The playgrounds open on the 7th, which was great. People are really using them and trying to follow the rules. Um, you know, it is hard when you have little kids. It was a little bit like herding cats, but they really are having fun on the playground again, which is great. And we had two more blood drives. So we were able to um, have a two-day event where we collected a bunch of blood and just over, like when you add everything together, all the blood drives, it was a, um, 1,119 units of blood to help folks. So um, we crushed it. We crushed it and uh, feel really good about that. And uh, just looking forward, really hoping to be able to open up to some other classes. Um, Patty is going to be working on some, bringing in some classes to the building. And like Kelly said, Jason's trying to get some things going, but um, people are a little bit reticent. And not only that, I have the kids in the cohorts and I don't like to have other things in the building because we do only have the two big restrooms and it's just not possible to keep everybody socially distant. So we're doing the best we can to fill things up and bring things back and try to get back to some sort of normalcy, but just not quite there yet. Thanks, Rochelle. Yep. Does anybody have any questions for Rochelle? All right, thank you. Okay, well, I am up. Uh, Terraland has actually been really pretty busy. Uh, Marin County came out with uh, guidelines as far as percentages that could come back into the building. So as soon as that happened, we were busy trying to reconfigure rooms to figure out what classes could come back in, uh, how to make sure people are socially distant. Um, our Jazzercise program, which actually started outdoors back in July, they are continuing outdoors until the weather changes, so that's nice. Uh, we do have a church group who meets here on Sunday outdoors. Unfortunately, capacity indoors still does not allow them to return indoors just yet. Um, and other than that, we have our ceramics program that's here five days a week. We have Pilates. Um, we have, let's see, oh my goodness gracious, uh, Mark Day, which is the, not Mark Day, Montessori de Terra Linda, which is just down the road. Um, they usually contract with us uh, during the school year for park use. And now that schools are allowed to start reopening, they are actually back with us uh, using the park and uh, play space area for their PE and their recess time. So it's great to have them back over here. Um, and we have the pool open until November 15th. 
uh, which has been great. Um, as Rochelle mentioned with the whole clean air process, we have run into some obstacles with air quality. So we are constantly monitoring air quality and having to, when there's a question, we're having to be up at 5 a.m. to assess if the air quality is going to be in a good area or zone for us to open for the day. Um, and uh, we're just trying to do our best to track everything that's going on to keep the pool open until November 15th. And other than that, uh, one of our, I like to say successes is that we're trying to onboard employees for next season, hoping that we are where we should be for next season for the pool. So working with Tiffany Haley, our program coordinator, she teaches like our training classes we were able to come up with a lifeguard training class for some of our staff that we were hoping to onboard this season and run them through lifeguard training. Uh, the catch was that they had to bring in two family members to serve as their victims. Uh, so we did have some mom and dads and some siblings show up uh, to play them in the water uh, so they could get certified. So that was wonderful. Um, and another thing to note is that uh, the Vesta Marin that the Pacific Sun does, uh, Nadia, um, our ceramics teacher here, she reserved or received the award for best instructor for ceramics and um, best uh, studio for ceramics. So she has her youth programs going on here. Jason Fong has his dance brigade class going on here. Our toll painting, which has a lot of older students, they're back here on Fridays. Um, so it's kind of nice. We're busy every day of the week and it almost feels like we're back to normal with some modifications. And I think that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Does anyone have any questions for Debbie? Commissioner Reisinger, I do, I'm just wondering, um, are the orcas, are they doing anything for fall? I just, I don't, remember recalling that from your presentation. Yes, the orcas, are getting, the orcas are continuing until November 15th as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else? Great. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll go really quickly with Falkirk Cultural Center because um, to be honest, uh, the fall programming is looking very similar to the summer programming. Um, the we've got the um, the watercolor class is continuing outside. They are starting to look at options for when the weather turns. Um, considering it's it's a little bit tricky bringing things inside at Falkirk because the rooms are small, so the amount of people that you can fit socially distance in each room is pretty low. Um, but we're we're looking at options either um, or or potentially bringing it to Zoom um, once once it's just not comfortable to be outside anymore. Um, and we do we are still getting occasional requests for socially distanced weddings and and other events. So just and and a lot of inquiries for next year. So just working on showing people the facility um, safely, scheduling tours of the facility. Um, and hope, hopefully getting things lined up so when we can open back up, we're, we're ready to go. And, and just continuing with the, um, with the virtual art galleries as well. Um, yeah. Any questions for Catherine? Thank you, Catherine. Um, Commissioner Gutierrez here, can I ask? Uh, it's actually not a question, it's a comment, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for this. This is amazing information, um, and I echo Commissioner Reisinger's comments that I, I definitely didn't know a lot of this was going on um, and would definitely love to find a way that I can uh, get myself better informed, but also however you guys can help better inform us, because uh, it seems like I'm not alone. But truly, truly amazing work. Um, I'm very and uh, Debbie, uh, the it's amazing how you got your lifeguard class. That's that's great. You got your family dummies. So I just want to say thank you, guys. Thank you. Now, I got a quick I got a quick comment, Jeff. Sure. Hey, so I, I just want to say, you know, as a San Rafael resident, so very proud to have uh, people like you working for uh, for all of us citizens. I mean, you guys are incredible. 
uh, definitely rock stars. A question I had um, in regards to when you guys were calling the, the older folks, the 70-year-olds and the 90-year-olds, how did you identify, how did you identify those folks? So I, I will jump in there. So we have a list that we don't normally share. It's the voter rolls that we get from the county. And so we have the ability, we use the same one um, for to support the age friendly surveys that they were doing to identify those individuals that are over 50 and live in San Rafael. So that's actually what we started to use um, as kind of a basis. And then we also got additional information as well. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. Please go ahead, Commissioner Reisinger. I'm just wondering, did you, with your, uh, I think, I believe it's perfect mind, your registration software, did you identify any individuals who are over the age of 90 or 80 and then call them to reach out about any of your services? We, um, most of the people that are older adults that participate in our programs here are through the Golden Airs and they do not use perfect mind. So the database that we utilized was the same one that I just mentioned, which is the voter rolls. So actually, um, last year, the Golden Heirs had a celebration. Actually, it was this year. <laughs> Feels like last year. It was February. Um, they actually had a birthday party for everybody over 90. And it was unbelievable how many people there were. And we had several people that were over 100. So, I mean, like we had hundreds of people over the age of 90, not just a couple. So um, very surprising. And Rochelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Patty, um, one of our program coordinators, was doing direct outreach to Golden Air's members yep. as well. That's correct. She, um, there was, I mean, just sort of, she does that anyway. She sends out the newsette, and then when people found out she was working or whatever, they could email her, that happened. But she also reached out to people that she had heard you know, it's all a big network, right? So they're all talking to each other. And so she was able to find out like who was kind of struggling and pal them up with another friend or she called and checked on a lot of people. She had a lot of work to try to make sure that people were still staying engaged and if they needed something, had someone that they could talk to. That sounds absolutely wonderful. I'm fully in support of that. I realize it's very hard to identify individuals who don't use internet or email or anything like that for services. I'm wondering, is there any relationship with the police department to do regular wellness checks on anyone who is older or safety checks or the fire department, I believe is part of Center Fall as well. Just wondering if there's any type of partnership that has been developed in terms of the health and wellness, mental care checks for individuals who are suffering from loneliness and social isolation during this time. I'm not sure on what they actually coordinate. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but I can tell you that during the process when the older adults were being contacted, there was several library and recreation staff that were participating in that. And they had a script that they went off of and they made notes of anyone who had resources or concerns that they couldn't be addressed that was forwarded to the EOC kind of in the branch of law and safety. And it was addressed through that. Great, thank you. I will say I know that the county is also um, currently building out a countywide program to um, to kind of continue with the the individual calls to our older our older residents. Um, so that's that's continuing, and, and we're coordinating with the county on that. And a lot of that is going through our volunteer management um, team. So we, we do have a couple of staff members that are specifically dedicated to, to coordinating volunteers for the city and they've been spearheading a lot of that work and coordinating that work. Is that within this department or a different department? No, it's within the city manager's office, I think. Um, it's If anyone knows Corey Bidoff, um, he's our volunteer coordinator or volunteer and sustainability manager. So he's, he's kind of in his own little sphere within the city manager's office. Which sounds wonderful. Just so I can summarize for myself as a commissioner, if I, you know, I live in Santa Venetia and there's like Santa Venetia is either a lot of very young new families because we can only afford it here or it's a bunch of old people who've been here forever. Um, so if there's an older person who needs assistance and I was like, hey, 
Mr. Hughes, you need assistance. It would be reaching out to the city manager's office to give them the phone number or not community services. Just wondering like where, like we as commissioners, how can we be representatives and ambassadors to supporting community members who are elderly in the community? Like, like what's the number we reach out to? So there's, there's several different resources and we can probably talk about that offline. But one of the resources that's available that a lot of people don't know about is 211. Um, it is a resource and referral agency that you can call in any county and they will give you information not only about seniors, but legal assistance, housing assistance, uh, you know, it's, it runs the gamut and it's free and people don't know about it. So um, I encourage you guys, number one, to Google 211.org. Um, and when you take a look at all the resources that they have, they used to produce something that is very similar to like a, I'm dating myself here, a telephone directory. It was huge and everything is online now, but even people, if you were living in Arizona and your folks were out here and you needed to find them help here, like assisted living, you could call them and they will give you uh, resources and referrals. So they're fantastic. Locally, it would be Whistle Stop would be your go-to. Um, and the reason I suggest that is that's not only obviously transportation, but it's meals, it's health services, and it's kind of all encompassing. So they're kind of the larger group here. With us, we really are just focusing more on the recreation and really supporting Golden Airs. Um, I'd like to say, um, if I can take a minute, just uh, thank you to you all. It's really great um, to hear all the creative ways that um, you've kept the public involved in park and recreation in our city and we're really lucky to have all of you really we really are and your recognition is all well deserved and i know i can speak with, for everyone on the commission that we appreciate everything that you do really and um, we're, we're just lucky to have you thank you well, we appreciate all the support and um, I just want to publicly acknowledge all of our managers here um, that we have on the line tonight on the meeting. They're fantastic. Yes, very, very fortunate. I know. Um, but I also will provide to you in a follow-up email. I know we send you the Friday memos. I want to address a couple questions that came up. This information, although it isn't as elaborate, because once you get us in front of cameras, we are recreation staff. We definitely like to tell you everything that we're doing. Um, but all this information is in the Friday memos that I have forwarded to you. So if you haven't received the last few, I'll make sure to push them back out. I will also show in an email the different Facebook pages. Um, we have, um, in, a, in a good way, we have many of them. In a bad way, we have many of them. So sometimes if you are um, following on one Facebook page, you might miss something on another. But they tend to um, publicize and cross-reference each other. But we have several Facebook pages, one for Tara Linda, one for Albert Park, um, Albert Borough and Pickley Park. Falkirk has its own. I'm not sure if San Rafael does. But then we also have our generic San Rafael Recreation uh, Facebook page. We also have Instagram pages as well. So I'll, I'll send that all out to you if you want to follow, if you haven't followed them. But we post kind of high level stuff there. But the Friday Memos really covers two weeks at a time. Uh, brief narratives about everything that you just heard tonight. So we'll be glad to make sure that you're getting that as well. And as we go forward, as our poor staff, because I think I opened this up, our full-time staff are running everything. We have very limited temp staff that are working. So what you see on the screen, with the exception of maybe some about five more people behind them, this is all we've got to do all of this. So for their ability to come to meetings is really, um, it, it, they're stretched. And so I've been very conservative about their time and was fortunate enough that they could come tonight. But going forward, as we get a little bit of a breather, we're hoping to highlight each one of the centers maybe on a monthly basis going forward. But we wanted to catch you up based on some of the comments and feedback that you gave us last month. So hopefully this helped to catch you up. I did want to make one, one more mention while Susan was talking about the Facebook pages reminded me um, that 
you, if you follow our Facebook pages, as uh, on Monday, we'll be starting to promote, we are changing our website. We are moving off of livelifelocally.org and we will be moving into the City of San Rafael website. So we'll be cityofsanrafael.org slash recreation. Um, there's a, a few, a number of different reasons behind that, but a lot of it is people go to the city website expecting to find our services there. And when they search the city website, because we're on a different URL, it doesn't show up on the city's search function. So moving that in is going to kind of align us more with, with the city's website um, and kind of that'll be a real benefit to us. So it's a good time to do it because our website is a little bit slow right now. We're not getting the traffic we normally do, um, but that'll be, that'll be coming next on Monday. Great. Um, thank you, Catherine. That was really important to make note of, and we'll be glad to give you that information as well in a follow-up email. Um, unless there's any more questions, I'd like to send my staff home, literally <laughs> and figuratively. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. All right. As we move forward, um, our agenda item number four the informational report on the city's current recreation fees. All right, so I'd like to introduce Catherine Kufa. She's going to give you a little bit of an overview, a little bit more than a little bit. She's going to give you an overview of currently what the recreation fees are and some of the challenges that we are currently having as kind of a precursor to coming back to you in December to talk about the recommended new fees going forward and the reason for that. So we're we're kind of having this as a two-step process because it is pretty overwhelming. So Catherine, go ahead. All right, let me get the... So I think Susan kind of just took my opening, the, to my talking points for my opening slide. Um, but, but basically we're gonna review, oh, let me get it into presentation mode. Okay, well basically we're gonna review the current fee structure. Um, as a preparation, kind of laying the groundwork for when we come back to you with the fee update. In the fee update, we are going to be coming back with a number of kind of structural changes. Um, and and uh, so we thought it'd be good to kind of get this baseline of information so that that, so that, that at the next meeting when we talk about that or the meeting in either December or January, um, we'll be able to really focus on, on the recommendations. So just a little bit of background, um, the recreation fees are part of a broader fee schedule that is adopted at the city council level for the entire city. Uh, the last time the city of San Rafael went through a comprehensive fee update process was in 2011. So you can imagine since that time, we've had a lot of changes in, in our programming. Um, and since then, really almost none of the recreation fees have been updated. Um, there is one exception that the Borough Community Center, their commercial fees in 2011 were set at 50% of, set at a rate of 50% of the San Rafael Community Center fees. And in 2014, for the commercial rentals only, that was raised to 75% of the San Rafael Community Center fees. Besides that, um, the fees that I'm going to be talking about now really have not been officially changed by at the city council level since 2011. Um, so as I mentioned that we've been working with the consultants over the past year, and I've actually been lucky enough to um, be the staff member that's been supporting the citywide update. So I've been working with Nadine, our finance director on this. I've gotten a, to really understand a lot of the other departments a lot better by getting to work on their fees. Um, and also been really able to spend a lot of time on the recreation fees. Um, we're getting to the end of that process um, and we'll be bringing it for community input in December and January. So in this presentation, I'm going to run through the main categories of recreation fees. I'm just going to present kind of a high level of what the fees are and then in a few of the areas point out opportunities where we can really um, in this update better align our current the fees with our current services. So I'm going to start with the facility rental fees. These are a really important fee for us. They make up 26% of our division revenue. Um, this is particularly true at, at the Borough Community Center and the San Rafael Community Center. Those two facilities, we have the largest number of rentals. Um, 
but it's also true at Falkirk where rentals really make up the bulk of the revenue generated there. And we also see the revenues at Falkirk, while the number of revenues are not as high as at Falkirk and or at, as at San Rafael and, and Boro, um, they really generate a lot of revenue because they tend to be longer events, their weddings, um, and Falkirk has a higher hourly rate. Um, so the, the facility rental fees, they include room fees, the deposit, staff fees, the kitchen rental fees, um, and we have them at different levels. There's um, nonprofit fees, private rental fees, and commercial rates. And you'll see that, that those three kind of group categories are pretty common across a lot of our different fee, um, fee types. Well, we also have a resident versus non-resident fee for our facility rentals. Um, and I think it's important to note that while I kind of clumped all of our facility rentals into one page, one slide here, the Falkirk, Falkirk fee structure really is substantially different from other community center fees. Um, it really offers a different service. So we have, um, we have different rates for weekdays versus weekends. Um, we have state, different, different rates based on the season. Um, and there also is not a resident versus non-resident rate at Falkirk currently. Um, the next area I wanted to talk about is the community gardens. Um, if you look at our actual fee schedule, this is not currently pulled out as a separate fee. It's kind of clumped into the commu Terra Linda Community Center fees. Um, but we wanted to pull it out here separately to make a few points. Um, the first point is that uh, on the current adopted schedule, there's only one fee set for the Terra Linda Community Garden. We don't even have a fee that's been adopted for the Canal Community Garden. That community, when, when these fees were originally set, the Canal Garden was um, managed by the Canal Alliance. Uh, and since that time, the city has taken it over, um, but we have not yet adopted a, a fee specifically for the Canal Community Garden. Um, and both at the canal and the Terra Linda Garden, we offer full and half plots um, that, that folks can, can rent. Um, but again, we only have the one fee. So, so staff have had to kind of figure out how to work within that. But I think moving forward, it's going to be an area where we'll want to better align the fee structure with the services that are actually currently offered. So in the aquatics program, um, we have a lot, if you look at the aquatics program in our fee schedule, it's a, it's a long list. We have a lot of different aquatics fees and almost all of them are related to different types of season passes. So we have 16 different season passes that are broken down by family size, age, and time of year sold. But then we also have resident versus non-resident rates in our season passes. So if you add it all up, we really have 32 different fees for our, for our um, pool passes. Um, the season passes at the Terra Linda pool last from April through September. Um, and at Hamilton, they last from Memorial Day through Labor Day. And Hamilton does have a different, uh, the, their fees are, are, their season passes are less to account for that difference in timing. Um, so this, this is an area that we're definitely hoping to simplify with the fee update when we bring this back. Um, it's, it's a lot of different fees that we're working with. I think it's, it's probably confusing and, and there'd be some benefits to, to simplifying this. Um, and it would also bring us more into alignment with what our neighboring agencies are doing. And that, that's another thing you're going to see when we come back with the update. We did look at a lot of what the other neighboring agencies are doing. So that'll be, um, that'll be kind of a, a part of, of trying to restructure. Um, additionally, there are a number of services that we currently offer at our pools that are not in the master fee schedule. So we provide swim lessons, we have picnic rentals at the pools, we do pool rentals for the orcas, for school end of year parties, um, for master swim groups, um, and none of those are adopted fees. So that's another area where we, we want to make sure all of the services that we offer are going to be in this updated fee, um, fee chart. So um, the athletic fields, um, the city has four athletic fields at different, or has athletic fields at four different parts, parks that um, we rent out in one form or another. Um, at Albert Park, we have baseball, and softball fields. At Bernard Hoffman, we have a softball field. At Pickleweed Park, we have two soccer fields. And at Victor Jones, we have a t-ball field. 
So as you can just see from this list, these fields have really different amenities, but we only have one fee for all city athletic fields. So this is an er another area where we, we need, we want to make the fees better match the actual amenities. Um, additionally, so while the athletic fees, we do have the, um, you know, nonprofit, private and commercial rates. There is no differentiation between resident and non-resident. So that's another area where we kind of just want to, we're, we're going to want to align all of our fees um, so they have more of a similar structure. So if we've got a resident and non-resident in our facilities and our aquatics, we would also want to have that in our athletics fields and our parks, which I'm going to talk about next, and which also our picnic rentals do not have, differentiate between resident and non-resident currently. So we have six parks um, with reservable picnic areas. They're Gerstle, Pickleweed, Santa Margarita, Sun Valley, Terra Linda, and Victor Jones. Um, our current fee schedule differentiates between small and large picnic sites. Um, what we see is that Gerstle and Pickleweed really have the greatest number of picnic rentals. Um, and that's followed by Santa Margarita and Sun Valley. Um, it is important to note, note that Gerstel does have three different picnic areas. They've got the Redwood Grove and then two smaller picnic areas, which really bumps up the number of rentals we see there. Um, and Victor Jones also has two different rental spaces. So the tennis courts, um, the tennis courts include two different types of fees. We have the key sales, which Rochelle mentioned earlier, um, we just rekeyed the courts in July, and then we also have a court rental fee. So the tennis key program was started, I think, in 1996 or 1997, um, and the original goal of the key program was to generate enough revenue to maintain and repave the courts. So just as a little insight into how that element is going. This year, when you account for the cost of rekeying the locks, the program has generated a total, like a net of about $2,500 in revenue. To repave one tennis court is upwards of $80,000. So we really, the tennis key program is really at this point not generating enough revenue to kind of met, meet that goal. Um, given the number of courts and how regularly they need to be repaved. Um, the other goal is to secure the courts at night and off hours. Um, and that has, has worked to, to varying degrees. Recently, we're seeing kind of an uptick in folks um, vandalizing the locks and breaking them. So that has been um, a, a challenge to kind of work through. Um, so the, the key program overall has had mixed success. And this might be a topic for for a future commission meeting to discuss. Um, I think probably not, not during the, the fee discussion, but maybe as, as its own standalone item. Um, the court rentals, while we do have an adopted fee, we really do not get people requesting to rent the courts regularly. Um, I don't think we've had a court rental in, in a few years, um, but I think it's a good fee for us to have just in case. Um, film and photography. Um, the city has two sets of film and photography fees, one specifically at the Fall Park Cultural Center and one in our city parks. Um, the city really generates minimal revenue from this type of fees. I think we have, you know, less than half a dozen of these requests a year. So that's kind of a synopsis of our current fees and just a little some some hints as to what you might be seeing when we come back with kind of the proposed fee updated fee schedule. Um, I think that's going to be a really meaty discussion for this group. I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of changes there um, to give you kind of a timeline on that. In the early part of November, we're going to be meeting with the, the city manager and the directors to kind of review the initial um, report. And then in December, early December, that will be going to the finance committee for their review. And then it will be coming to the boards and commissions in December and January for public input with the goal of having it approved um, or adopted at the second city council meeting in February. That is the goal right now. It, it could change, but that's, that's what we're shooting for at the moment. 
All right, so I want, I ho hopefully I didn't go too quickly through that. I know you guys, we just had a long, a long, uh, a long presentation. So wanna, hopefully we got, yes. All right, Chair Jones, I'll, I'll turn it over for comments and questions. All right, Chair. You're rising here, question. Thank you, Chair Jones, I appreciate it. Um, no, that was a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. I really personally love seeing the detail that has come out from this meeting on every presentation. That's something that I've looked forward to seeing. Um, I, I have a bit of a couple questions, but um, my first kind of question is like with community gardens, I'm wondering, does the city have a cost recovery goal or target or program or specific structure set up to where the community garden does not have to generate any or ha has to hit a certain target area because having worked with community gardens they are time um suckers for lack of a better word <laughs> yeah so that's something you're gonna see coming through with the fee proposal um that we at, at the current level um and the current structure there we don't have a clear cost recovery for it, but we're going to be coming. We, we have done some analysis on what it would really cost to properly upkeep the gardens. Um, and that is going to be included as part of kind of the presentation on the community garden up, the update. So are you guys going to be branching into an entire cost recovery fee schedule for the entire department in terms of program area or no? No, um, a lot of a lot of the and this will there's we'll, we'll go into this in detail um a lot most of the fees were set are, are kind of set based on uh, market rates so unlike community development or public works um recreation fees do not have to be set based on cost recovery by there's the, the consultants told us there's a, a some public sec resource code um that says that uh Recreation fees can be based on market rates as opposed to cost recovery. So we have done some cost recovery analysis, but to be honest, our cost recovery rates are so low that if council wanted us to set them at 100% cost recovery, we would basically have to double all of our all of our rates. Our, our department is at about 50% cost recovery right now. Um, so. And I'm not, I'm not asking you guys to get to 100% cost recovery. I'm just. Um, where I guess where I'm getting it is it's very common for recreation and community services districts to have a gradation of, you know, zero to 30% cost recovery for rental rates or no, no, I'm sorry, the other way around, uh, you know, different gradations for, you know, if it's a wedding rental that benefits 1% of the community, so it needs to generate money. It's a profit generation. Whereas, for example, swim lessons benefit the community because it's a safety lesson they don't need to generate money type deal so yeah. i'm just the city of san rafael to my knowledge and i could be very wrong please tell me if i am has never had a cost recovery target goal for their program areas which in having worked for both san rafael as well as many different community centers it's um you know the amount of time that staff which very limited staff right now spend on areas that are completely not cost recovery and don't benefit a very large amount of the community. It seems very interesting that, that it's still part of the model that we're going to continue. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if, if there's any goal to move towards a cost recovery model. You know, gradation scale. Would, yeah, I'm wondering if that would come into the parks master plan, if something like that would be uh, a portion of the parks master plan. Susan, does that sound? It, it can, but as these fees are being reviewed by the different boards and commissions, one of the goals is for us to recoup as many, as much of our direct and indirect costs as possible. But I think what Catherine's also noting here is even if we were to aim for 100% cost recovery for some areas and maybe 50 or 25% or whatever, some of those are so, would price us out of the market, to be quite frank. I know with childcare, our goal has been, I think it's 
and we're hovering right now. Um, well, right now is a different time, but we are hovering right below that. But that's the only program that we've ever come close to 100% recovering our costs. Um, but you're right. There is usually a city usually determines where they, their target is for a variety of things. They determine whether it is a private benefit. And if it's a private benefit, usually cost recovery goals are extremely high, like 100% or higher. If it is a community benefit, like special events or um, volunteer program, there is usually zero to 25% cost recovery because the expectation is it's really an investment in the community. So cities often set up the goals. As part of this fee study, it was determined that they were not going to do that. But I believe that is going to be one of the questions that the finance committee will be asking as where, if these fees are, rec uh, if these fees are approved as recommended, and we're currently at 50%, if we were to model out what we're going to achieve, what is that, is that going to move that needle up a little bit? But they have not gotten into the granular um, senior program should be at 25%, youth sports should be at 15 They have not done that exercise. Um, which is fine. I'm just, I mean, are they, are they going to do that? It seems very standard that many parks and recreation, community services, libraries, arts and rec, whatever department you want to call them, ha have a gradation. I'm just, which I also believe helps your staff shoot for a target because you know if they're doing you know special needs special events programs they're supposed to be 100 percent cost recovery they're not going to do it like we get it but if they only need to be 20 percent cost recovery then it it helps shoot a, a target goal Catherine, i don't know if, if you've had discussions with nadine about that i think we kind of moved away from that um that has been my to be honest that has been my experience in all my prior agencies um, where they set goals on what the different programs were going to be as they did the fee study and then they kind of merged the two. I think what you heard Catherine say, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna speak for her, but I think what we heard from our, um, our consultants was that is, that is a huge amount of work and what they were brought in to do is really to analyze the fees on a market, on a market basis. Um, currently, what are we offering? What is the value of that? And what will the market bear? Um, and their recommendation from the get-go was, you know, you can have these cost recovery goals, but if your cost recovery goal is 100% and right now you are collecting $2 and you have to collect $200, you are not going to achieve it anyway. So I think what we're doing, and Catherine, please jump in. I think what we're doing is making recommendations based on what our direct costs are and where we think this our different fees should be for the different programs and events and facilities. And once we get feedback from the different boards and commissions, we'll be able to give feedback to the council. This will move the needle so we are recovering X amount of costs going forward. In the last study that was done in 2011, I believe as part of the municipal code, I think they had adopted some uh, very high level cost recovery goals but they were extremely confusing. Um, they had, and I've seen this before where they have recommended 60% for aquatics and 40% for youth. And then the question comes up, well, what if you have a youth aquatics program? Which one, which one are you using? So they had them, but they can be confusing if they, if they don't kind of drill down. So I don't want to get into too much detail because Catherine is going to be coming back to you in December and there's going to be a lot. I go. I just, just ask. Yeah, no, I mean, and Kat, I think you're, you're right. That, that would be a very helpful tool. I think we're taking it one step at a time at the moment. Um, and I think just updating the fees as a whole has, is a huge undertaking. Um, and that's really where the, where we had the capacity. Um, I do, I hope that this does spur that further discussion um, and that, that maybe we can use these, the, these discussions to, to get there and to develop that that type of more useful tool. Um, but I think for the moment, this, this study and the consultants and, and, and the focus has really been just on getting an updated fee structure and set fees so that we can start implementing those. And then maybe that more kind of strategy level um, could be part of the, the fee, the park and rack master plan or, um, you know, just could be something we, we push for. Um, but, yeah, that, that's where we're at at the moment with that. 
And Chair Jones is correct. Um, usually in a park rec master plan in the very back, they usually have funding um, options or recommendations. And usually you will see um, some component in there of that the city or the department should strive to recover its costs. And it usually talks about a little bit about, you know, 100% of its direct and a portion of its indirect costs to be self-sustaining. And so that's usually included in there. And then that kind of gives you the impetus for going forward to developing it even more. But the fees haven't been done in nine years. So there's been a couple that have been modified as we've gone, but we're going off of fees that are nine years old and you know we, we need to we start need to kind of move forward. And if you look through the list of uh, in our agenda packet, um, there's quite a few fees for the they listed the uh, city of San Rafael master fee schedule. And there's go through it. There's quite a few in there. It's amazing that any of them were missing in the beginning. You know, Catherine mentioned that we have a lot of different programs and activities that these were never adopted. It's amazing that we missed any. But. Yeah. Any more questions? I do. Uh, Catherine, thanks for the presentation. And again, your slide's going to be available. That'd be great. And uh, with respect to tennis and specifically Albert Park, uh, you mentioned the the uh, the, the uh, approximate number for repaving a tennis court versus cost recovery on selling keys, and there's a real imbalance there. And I don't know that we ever will close that gap, but uh, it would seem that that through casual observation, one person buys a key and lets all their friends in. And I don't know that we have any way to to deal with that. And you mentioned, and I've been aware of, of some damage to the locks, and uh, clearly there needs to be more of a, a sense of community over there and a sense of of uh, living up to the, the standards that the city expects with respect to uh, buying keys and, and using them uh, appropriately. Uh, I think graffiti and litter is a real problem there, and I've called it in. I've photographed a lot of graffiti on the walls on those low retaining walls by the bleachers in different places I've called it in and sent it to public works and there's been no action. So maybe just as a note for you, just to uh, go out there and take a look at the situation with respect to the overflowing trash cans and the, and the graffiti at Albert Park Tennis. But overall, uh, uh, you're doing an amazing job and, and the, uh, the need for upgrading uh, and, and analyzing the fees is long overdue, and I, I'm pleased that you're in charge of, of this aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Reisinger, one more question. Yeah, sorry, I apologize. I realized right. that I was fascinating. Um, I'm just wondering, you had mentioned, Catherine, in your presentation, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I get the wording right. Um, you were saying that you were simplifying your fees to make sure that it is easier for everyone to understand. I'm just curious because it seems like in a time of COVID right now, when everyone, and you know, I belong to X, Y, and Z, park and rec groups, blah, blah, blah. Everyone is getting a little bit more complicated with their fees. Are they getting a little bit more strategic or creative? However you want to talk about it in terms of trying to get people to engage in their programs and sign up because so many people are not signing up. I'm just wondering with the fee structure that's going to be adopted, is it for the next 12 months? Is it for five years, six years that we haven't had a fee for a very long time? Are we getting smart in what we're doing you know you had mentioned specifically the pool with the membership base and having worked in aquatics for a million years you know having 12 different membership options can be confusing when you look on a piece of paper but it's actually really useful when you're a user so i'm, I'm just wondering kind of your take on that either way so uh, when I say simplify probably the only area that we're looking to simplify is in the aquatics fees um, and I'm not going to, I don't want to preempt it. Um, so we, we can talk about it when we come and, and actually you have the, the structure in front of you and we can dis discuss specifics, but that's really the, the only area that will probably be coming with something that's more streamlined than what we currently have. In a lot of other areas, we are adding more nuance 
um, to our fee structure. And this is, this is a fee structure for the long term. This is not for COVID. Um, the goal is that um, once we have adopted this updated structure, the city will be doing updates every year moving forward. So it will be probably, um, I think, like a 2% cost of living increase annually or some, that, that, that will kind of be to be decided by city council. Um, but, and at that time when there's kind of an across the board percent increase, we would also look at if there are certain fees that aren't working or need to be structures that need to be changed or amended. Um, so um, for example, the resident swim fee is $5 with your, your card. It has been $5 for 20 years, which I agree is totally low. Where I am, it's $8. But you're saying it will move to a 2% increase every year unless there's backlash or issues with that on some type of level. I can't, I'm, so the, that's to be determined. I, that hasn't been set yet. Um, I think this, the city is gonna be looking at some sort of es annual escalator, what exactly that is, how that's applied. I totally agree that for something like a swim pass, which is very small, you add a 2%, then you're paying like 505, you know, it just gets kind of weird. So I think there, you know, there would be some, um, recognition that that across the board probably wouldn't work for every single fee you know maybe it's for for swim fees it's every five years it goes up by a dollar i'm not i'm not sure we had that hasn't been set i think at the moment we're just updating it now and then how we move the plan is just to have a more regular annual update as we move forward so we don't get into the situation where nine years down the road we're having to do this massive lift because nobody's really looked at it in, in almost a decade. So what, what that annual update looks like is still to be determined and probably won't be determined until a year from when the fees are adopted. That's probably when, when they'll start thinking about it. Um, but, but that's just to, to indicate that there is going to be some sort of annual update and annual evaluation of the fee um, and what that exactly looked like um, will is, is um, still kind of in the works. And some cities, um, and the reference to the, like the 2%, some cities, when they adopt their fees, they normally do it on an annual basis um, when they adopt their budget. Um, but some cities give some flexibility to the city manager and department heads that within like 2% or 1%, if you want to raise your fees, it doesn't require to go back to council. But it takes council initially to make that recommendation and improve it so that we can, we can act you know, individually and go forward. But otherwise, I can't just willy-nilly raise it 10% without going back to them. So there's usually safeguards in there, but we're hoping that they give us some flexibility. Otherwise, it is an annual process, which is pretty involved. Thank you, I appreciate the deep dive. Um, I will stop talking. I just, um, just, you know, cognitive of where all of the fees are being increased, how it's being perceived by the public when it hasn't been done for the last 20 years because then everyone freaks out and we do need to cost recovery a little bit more. I am a huge advocate for a cost recovery target goal. I know it's a lot of work initially. Let me know if I can help in any way, but I think it helps guide staff in, um, you know, is it a $4 swim or a $6 swim for whoever goes through? It's currently $8 in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> You sign up online with the new reservation system, but it's been wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Commissioner Gutierrez. Is there something that um, happened at city council or at the city level that, that spurred them to want to adopt a more annual process? Or is this just kind of, I mean, it should, to me, it seems uh, logical. I just curious if something changed or um, I think it, um, just it's best practice. Um, and I, I mean, I think that, you know, the situation we're in right now where it hasn't been done for so many years just kind of makes you realize it, it needs to be done more regularly. Yeah. I don't know, Susan, if you have a different perspective, but that's kind of what cities, I've been hearing. Yeah, most of these do it um, on an annual basis, but how they do it is once they do this annual big fee study, what they do is they do a review of fees every year when they adopt their budget and they roll in any new fees. So let's say we started a brand new program. Let's say we all of a sudden had, I don't know, we had skiing here 
and we had to adopt new fees, it gives you the process of being able to roll those new fees in, in a process. But a city doesn't usually do this extensive study every year. What they do is they do a review of fees every year and then staff makes recommendations based on market or escalators or if it is really dependent on um, outside provider and like you know like trips and tours and things like that where those fees are going up staff makes recommendations and then they're adopted but about every five years they do this really thorough robust study unfortunately nothing has been done in nine years um, we're not the only city who hasn't done it. I worked, my prior city did the same thing during the recession. They thought it was a good idea not to do anything. Um, and then they kicked themselves for waiting so long because it was a really heavy lift after the recession rebounded. People were not ready for it. So um, I think everybody knows that it sounds good to wait, but it's best if every year incrementally you just look at the fees and then every about five years you do a, a major study. Yeah, so Catherine, yeah, no, it seems logical. Catherine's not just doing a little bit of review. She's, she's- So surprised. typically what, typically what Catherine's doing right now would have been more like a five year thing. They just kind of didn't right. it happen. It's all of it, all at once. And she got, she got picked. Lucky. Right person for the job. Yep. yep. Any other comments or questions? Great, we're on the home stretch, everyone. Uh, <laughs> agenda item number five, commission reports and comments. Has anyone been to any meetings, conferences, seminars attended by commission members? Or have any comments or questions? Uh, Commissioner Reisinger. Just a question, the uh, Region 1 Fall Forum usually happens about now. They are now, I forget their new name. It's like a super fancy name. Um, but it's virtual this year. Is anyone from San Rafael going to be attending it? I don't know. Receive ask. Okay. I guess not. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, I agenda item number six, schedule of upcoming meetings and events of interest. I know it was on the uh, agenda packet you sent out. Um, did you wanna talk about those or? Yeah, I just, I wanted to also go back and just cover a couple of things um, first before we just dive in. The schedule is really lean as you can imagine because we don't have any events going on, unfortunately. I do wanna bring up that we have two of our um, members on the Park and Rec Commission. Their, their initial first term expires at the end of this month and our alternates um, appointment ends at the end of this month. So for all three of those individuals, if they're interested in continuing on, um, just saying it out loud, I know you've received correspondence from the city clerk's office, you will need to reapply and go through the process to be reappointed. Um, if you do not do this, then this would be your last meeting. Um, and if it is your last meeting, then we will definitely invite you back to the next meeting that we have to recognize you and also make sure that the city council does a proclamation um, in respect of your years of service. So just, just wanna put that out there, but um, there's a couple members that will need to reapply if they're interested and uh, we are hoping that they will and we're hoping our alternate will as well. Um, I know that it's open and I believe Lindsay sent you out a information on it and link and all that good stuff. But if you didn't receive it, please let me know and we'll make sure to forward that information to you. Um, just wanted to cover that. I do have a recommendation that we were talking about last year when we set our schedule of going dark in December and having a meeting in November. However, because we will have three members who term out at the end of October, if we do not have new members reappointed in time for the November meeting, I would actually suggest the opposite, that we go dark in November, and then in December is when we're gonna be coming back with the fees, and by that time we will have a full Park and Rec Commission appointed, 
And we will also be able to elect the chair, vice chair, and set our calendar for next year. But I just wanted to make sure that that was okay because I know originally we were kind of hoping to go dark in December, but I wanted to check kind of show of hands or thumbs up if, if that's okay to skip November and to go with December. I'm counting just thumbs up. Okay. Um, Commissioner Oblitz? Yes. Is that <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Would it be all right with you? We were just discussing a start in November and having our meeting in December. It would be December 17th would be our meeting date. And at that meeting, we'll be electing a chair, vice chair, setting our schedule, as well as going over the recommendations for fee changes. So there will be no November meeting, but we would have December 17th. Is that the proposal? That's correct. And you're asking for my approval or, or? Yeah, we just got thumbs up from everybody else. So I just wanted to make sure that you got to weigh in on it. I think it's great. Can I rise in or? I don't mean to embarrass Chair Jones at all, but I'm wondering, are we able to elect him as chair again? Because it feels like he had four or five months where he didn't get to do anything <laughs> as chair or to come back. Like, his job. I'm um, just kind of wondering what, if that's allowable or not allowable. So that's a great question. Um, I think uh, this has been a year for the record. So I will share with you if we're lucky enough that he, see, I'm putting you on the spot, but if we're lucky enough that he, he reapplies and gets selected again to serve on the park and rec, it would be this commission could make the decision to reappoint someone as chair and vice chair, chair for a second year. We did this previously when I first got here. We had um, some members um, term off early. And so we had a chair that served more than one 12 month period. So it is allowable. It's not mandatory, but it is allowable. So by taking November off, we can let the dust settle. The reappointments will happen and we'll have a full slate. So we'll know exactly who we have. If we, if we were to move ahead in November, we might not have those three members reappointed and they actually couldn't be participate in the meeting. So we don't want that to happen. Okay, so I, I think I heard we're, we're good to go. So fantastic. So you get Thanksgiving off. Enjoy your time off. I'm not sure uh, if anyone's going anywhere. Um, I, but I would like to mention um, this will be my last meeting. I won't be reapplying. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. I've, I've been on this board, this commission for over 10 years now. And uh, I think it's time for some new blood and um, more creative blood. And I really appreciate the opportunity to serve, the opportunity to be a part of what it is we do here in San Rafael. And um, I just wanted to thank all of you and the opportunity for me to be chair for, <laughs> for a season here. And um, really just, Thank you so much. And uh, I do wish you all the best health and happiness. Well, Chair Jones, I will let the other commissioners weigh in, but I, I am very sad. I was really hoping we'd get a rebound, um, but it has been a pleasure serving under you and with all of the you. support that you've given me since I started. I, I will say that we will talk offline because the city council will want to recognize you at one of their new virtual meetings that will be coming up. And so we'll need to find out when you're available to zoom on in and be recognized for your years of service. So um, I will talk to you offline. Thanks so much. And with if I could, if I could just for a moment with the news that uh, Chair Jones has, has uh, chosen not to reapply and this will be his last meeting, I would like to echo other thoughts that uh, uh, thank you very much. And it, it's been a bizarre season and you really uh, didn't have the, the uh, number of meetings to, uh, to share that others have, but you've done a great job and you'll be missed. Thank you. Thank you very much, really. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so let me just, um, I just wanted to give you a heads up on the, the schedule that was provided for you. Um, just want to make sure you have a chance to glance at it. 
if you do any type of in-person services uh, or you're trying to reach out to the city in the month of November, I think you know that we're on furlough program, which means that there's 13 days during the year where staff is off um, and their salary is reduced accordingly. So that's not to make you feel bad. It's just to illustrate, let me give you the dates. Um, so on the schedule, it's November 9th, 10th, and the 11th is a holiday. So city hall offices are closed. Okay, so if you needed to do anything, city hall permits or whatever, we're closed. The whole week of Thanksgiving, we're also closed. So just want to make sure you know that. I always watch my email, so if you have a question or concern, um, don't hesitate to send me an email if you have anything that you need assistance with, and I'll do the very best I can to help you. That's it. Great. Well, with that said, 8.17, we close out the meeting, my last meeting. Thank you so much, everyone, and I uh, wish you all uh, Again, health and happiness and a great holiday. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Jones. Thanks. We'll see you in the parks. See ya. <laughs>